I now call the East Lyme Zoning Commission regular meeting of April 4th, 2024 to order at 7.34 p.m. If we could all rise and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, Here, Mr. Peck. Yep. Uh, Ms. Markovitz is not back yet. Mr. Foley? Yes. Ms. Kalau? Yes. Mr. Pivo? Anywhere? No? Uh, Ms. Our ex officio, Ms. Hardy? She's here. Great. Um, alternates, uh, Mr. Liska? Here. Good. Uh, Ms. Sisko? Here. Oh, good. And Ms. Juhas? Here. Good. Um, we have Mr. Maholland here and Ms. LaRocco. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, we have two seats to fill. Um, normally we go in alphabetical order, but I think because Ms. Sesco, you were not at the last meeting and did not go on the site walk, it's probably best if we see um, Ms. Juhas and Mr. Liska. Um, as always, it's time for public delegations. If there's anyone here from the public that would like to say something that is not on the agenda tonight. Um, if you're here to speak on the Boston Post Road application, there'll be time during, during that section of the meeting. So who here would like to speak on something not on the agenda tonight? Ms. McGowan, come on down. We missed you last week. Yes, I heard, I heard you needed your fan club. So just to remind everyone that, again, Ms. Mrs. Ann Thurlow is here um, sitting on the board, appointing herself on the board, not necessarily doing a good job uh, yet last Thursday controlling what went on. So just so everyone knows, she lost by either 40, 41, or 50 votes uh, in November. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Actually, it was 50, and I did not appoint myself to this position. But thank you. Anybody else? Okay. We have a public hearing. We have the continuation of application by Kristen Clark, PE, for conceptual site plan approval per Connecticut general statute and 830G affordable housing of a 25 unit age restricted single and multifamily affordable residential housing development to be located on the northerly, northerly side of Boston Post Road on a parcel identified as 91 Boston Post Road, Assessors Map 31.0, Lot 2. Um, I'd like to make a note that staff memos have been read into the record. Um, I would like to take a minute to approve the minutes of the site walk so we can enter those into the record. Um, the members present, just FYI, myself, uh, Ms. Kalau, Mr. Peck, Ms. Juhas, and Mr. Maholland were Ma there. Madam Chair, I think we have a correction. Uh, turn Garrity, I believe, uh, as an observation. Okay. Hey, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, I, I attended the site walk, as I know you did as well, yes. too, and, and the minutes as they were prepared indicate um, for representatives of the applicant, which is my client, English Harbor, um, Jeffrey Torrance was on their behalf. He was not there on their behalf. He was with Mr. Carlson from the East Lyme Land Trust, which brings me to the next matter is Mr. Carlson is not listed as being present um, during the site walk, nor was Ms. Mosier Dunn or Ms. Stoddard, who all were present for the site okay. walk. Um. Could we have a motion to approve the minutes with the amended corrections? Yes, yeah, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain. Okay, 501.
Thank you. So those will be added to the record. Um, I believe next we have a memo from Kristen Clark to re read into the record. It has been um, tagged as exhibit item GGG. It's a rather lengthy memo. Would someone like to volunteer to read it? Madam Chair, we have copies for the commission members to, to present along with the map. I don't know if they do, but if we can do that as it's being read along, it might make matters yeah. they, they easier. They do. Oh. Okay. But if they haven't read it yet, it might be information we'd need for the well, discussion if tonight. A, if everyone has a copy of the letter, fine. I brought copies. Mr. May has them. He, can, he will hand them out so that everybody can follow along with the reading of it. They are in their packets. Oh, okay. Thank you. Them. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Is the commission satisfied with that, or would they like to hear it? No, this is full of tables that are going to be impossible to make sense of okay. reading out loud. It if just you're doesn't comfortable, make sense. If you're comfortable with it. Madam Chairman, I, I would also suggest, I don't want to interrupt, um, given the time constraints um, you're faced with tonight, I, I think you can forego reading a lot of these mm -hmm. uh, letters well, we, we also have one from, I believe, Attorney Roger Reynolds. Is he here tonight? Yes. I, I believe when it, at the appropriate time he's going to read his into the record. Is that correct, Mr. Yeah, so will you read yours into the record later? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Moving right I'd along. Like have, at least give us time to read this. Yeah. Um, well, I think we'll also have a might have a break between the hearing and the meeting, which would give another few minutes. Um, okay, at this point, would Mr. Garrity like to speak? Certainly, thank you, Madam Chair, Commission members, Mr. Mulholland. Um, I have with me tonight Attorney uh, Anthony Novak, who, and, and he would be brief, it's just to address the issue of the fact that the property did not end up going to the land trust. He represented the land trust at the time. Um, I've asked him to come down and just give a brief uh, explanation as to what happened there, because um, he he's the one who has first-hand knowledge of that. And then I'll get into my part of the uh, presentation, and I will try and be as brief as possible, because I know everybody's under uh, significant pressure tonight. Good evening. My name is Attorney Anthony Novak. I represent the uh, East Lyme Land Trust and have uh, been their counsel for some time now. And they asked me to come here tonight because there were some misunderstandings about the facts of this case. Um, the land trust um, never owned the property. Uh, the property was owned by, as you were well aware, uh, Mr. Teitler, who passed away, and in his will he left the land trust, the property. However, there was a three, a $340,000 mortgage on that property, and so the land trust, if they accepted it, would have been subject to having to pay 340000 The State of Connecticut Superior Court came up with a value of $280,000, is what the court ordered and the uh, appraisal that came in. So the land trust was not about to accept a piece of property worth $280,000, with a $340,000 mortgage on it. They just didn't have the funds. So they declined to accept the property. In the meantime, the property was foreclosed by the first mortgage holder, uh, some third party. I don't know who they were off the top of my head at the time. Uh, I remember at the time it was uh, definitely in excess of the value. I filed a couple court motions in that foreclosure to try to uh, stall the foreclosure to give the land trust some time to either raise the money privately or obtain a grant from the state of Connecticut. We contacted the state of Connecticut uh, deep and uh, they informed us that because the property had uh, houses or buildings on it, they could not issue a grant and that the land trust, if they took the property, would have to uh, tear the houses down and then apply for the grant. Of course, it was $150,000 to tear the house down. So that's why the land trust never took possession of the property. Uh, I have been in negotiations with the current owner, and the current owners are willing to um, make an accommodation and provide to the land trust about eight acres. And the land trust is particularly concerned about Latimer Brook 
and the fact that it's a hatchery for many of the fish species that go into the Niantic River and ultimately uh, the, the sea. So uh, we have been in negotiation. The current owners, if they can get their subdivision approvals done, would be uh, amenable to giving us eight acres, when I say us, I mean the land trust, to protect the open space around Latimer Brook and also an outcropping, that's about seven acres, and there's an outcropping uh, on the map, that's on the top of the map, uh, that is outcroppings, a uh, ledge basically. And there's an actual ecosystem there that's important. Uh, and so we would preserve that and we would preserve uh, the property along the Latimer Brook at no cost to the land trust. And, and again, preserve it for the benefit of the town. So. I urge the commission to work with this developer because it benefits uh, the town, benefits the land trust uh, to preserve this. And, and we think it's an important um, piece of property. You may recall that uh, the land trust was instrumental in protecting uh, the properties that the town just purchased up at Achigachi Hills. And so uh, land trust has been doing a bang up job, 500 acres preserved in the last two years. $3.1 million worth of grants. Um, I think it's uh, definitely something that's positive. The Land Trust urges the commission to work with this developer. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, any questions? Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, we'll go ahead. But, okay. Sure, if it's, yeah. So, <clears throat> uh, how would, so on one side of the property, the eight acres, there's Latimer Brook. Yes. And on the other side, there's a cliff, you know, where that a that access ramp is. If somebody wanted to go and, and access the property, would there be a, a parking, or how would that actually be useful to anybody? The uh, actual use uh, for people to hike the property or walk the property uh, has not been laid out as far as my knowledge goes, but we are talking with the developer regarding a little area uh, which could be a, for folks to walk that. Uh, it's not definite. We're, we're talking to those folks to do that. But uh, right now, our main concern is to, to preserve it and then find a place to add a little parking area for people to walk it and fish and, and that sort of thing. But there's no definite area on the map. If I may, um, <clears throat> presently there's an easement as you come in the driveway that goes up to this area here and actually goes between the open space so you'd be able to access the upper open space from there we are working on access from here um, there's discussions about we have some additional parking up here um, we haven't quite finished a design in terms of a pathway and so forth but we do have additional parking so we would probably what we would do is reserve certain spots to for visitors leave that open and then create a signs for a path down to the open space along the river yeah. you know what I'm, I'm thinking is you know so somebody years down the road the, the people that live there are like why are these people walking through my property but right well yeah and, and you know candidly we don't anticipate there'd be a lot of people coming in there anyway I mean I think from just from a practical standpoint people are going to see this and think it's it's an apartment complex we're not going in there yeah if you're may, if they're made known but typically um, we don't. We wouldn't anticipate because it's a fairly small area in terms of walking trails that we would have, but um, important enough in terms of you know preserving it as open space that we would may ha may have a few people accessing it on occasion, but but not a lot. So fair enough. All right. Any further questions? Well, thank you for your time. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, Attorney Gady, do you have any other things to add? Fortunately for the commission, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, uh, I'd like to address uh, an issue that I uh, sent a letter to both Attorney Kerry and Mr. Mulholland on, and that is Commissioner Pivo. Uh, his comments at the last hearing on this matter, um, some of you may recall that he indicated that he had done some research outside the record and also made certain findings which he wished, it, wished to present to that. Having reviewed the minutes 
Um, I wrote a letter to Attorney Kerry and Mr. Mulholland indicating that I would ask that he be recused from any deliberations on that because I believe that he's overstepped his bounds as a commission member on this and to the extent he's doing independent research on it, it's a violation of my client's rights but also um, I, I think um, predetermining the outcome of this application. So I'd like to submit that uh, to Mr. Mulholland. Just exhibit. And copy for each other. I, 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 I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next item I would like to submit is the state of Connecticut's. Uh, affordable housing listing, um, which indicates which towns uh, exceed the minimum requirement, requirement of 10% and which towns do not. Um, and I'll just state for the record that the town of East Lyme is on there, and it's listed by the state as of this posting as not meeting the affordable housing requirements for the town of East Lyme. Uh, exhibit. Thank you. And then uh, additionally, I have a letter um, with some attachments to it, which Timothy. Um, this letter uh, responds to a number of items that have been discussed on here, including um, the uh, uh, correspondence from the Connecticut Fund for the Environment that Attorney Reynolds submitted. Um, I'm not going to read it verbatim. Uh, I will kind of go over some of the issues because I think we have already addressed a few of those issues, but there are a few in here that I think do warrant being highlighted. And first, let me address, in, in terms of the correspondence from the Connecticut Fund for the Environment, I, I have read that, um, we've gone through it, we have a response in this letter, but beyond that, I'm not going to address it, because what the Connecticut Fund for the Environment is asking you to do at this point in time is only something a judge of the Superior Court or the Connecticut Appellate Court can do. He's asking you to look at cases and make a decision as to whether you fall into that, and quite frankly, there are a number of cases out there that deal with various issues, and I find some of them to be extremely dense, and I, but the extent that CFE is telling you that you can't uh, hear a conceptual site plan or you should dismiss a conceptual site plan because one uh, is not permitted or does not exist under the statutory or regulatory framework, I'm simply going to tell you that's wrong, but that's not something that this commission needs to decide. This commission is going to do what it's going to do, um, and that uh, should be it for purposes of this hearing. Uh, briefly, to address the issue of the conceptual site plan, the courts have clearly said that 830G is a standalone statute, um, and as I've indicated in the JAG Capital case, where, this, where the town of East Lyme tried to uh, combine the requirement for affordable housing with a zone change application, the court in JAG Capital said you can't do that. You don't, under 830G, which is what this application is under, you do not, uh, you cannot require an, applica an applicant to make a uh, zone change as part of that. The conceptual site plan issue um, presents some very interesting uh, issues with it, because, and, and it's included in Exhibit C. In the town of East Lyme, up until December of this year, had in its regulations under the affordable housing statute conceptual site plans, and it listed four things, excuse me, five things that had to be submitted as part of a conceptual site plan. That's under the old 32-9, and those were an A2 survey, topographical contours at 10-foot intervals, ours are at two, 
location of wetlands, watercourses, and slopes in excess of 25 percent. We've shown that on the site plans. The general layout of all the proposed buildings and structures in areas proposed for open space. All of that is shown on there. What's interesting about 39.9.1 is it goes A through F, but there's no D in there. It somehow was left out. But in terms of that, when the regulations were amended in December, and I've attached both the old reg and, and the current regulations, it said you can, uh, the, an applicant can come in with three types of plans, conceptual, preliminary, or final. But it dropped all the requirements that were listed in 32.9.1 uh, on there, and it simply said a conceptual site plan. So you have to look to the statute for what's required under conceptual and we've met those requirements, uh, as I've indicated in, in prior correspondence and prior uh, documentation submitted to the Commission. Uh, there were some questions with regard to the sight lines on the property. Excuse Sorry, Mr. Norman. But you didn't apply in this Section 32. This no, we applied under 832. This, this, okay. and this is this is where no I have clarification. yes, no, no problem, and I appreciate that. This is where I have said, in terms of opening this up as a public hearing, and in terms of some of the questions or, or positions that people, either in the public or on the commission, may have taken, it is taking us way beyond what 830G requires at this point in time. Again, it's conceptual; it's not final. Mr. Mulholland did a fine job of pinning me down, saying what I have to come back with for a final, and I appreciate that because it demonstrates that we have other things to do if this commission decides to approve it. It is nothing but an, a, a, a basically an approval from this commission to say, yes, you may go ahead with this plan and we will consider it provided, however, as a, when you submit a final plan that meets all the other requirements, including wetlands, including whether we have to go to the state uh, for water, sewer, traffic, et cetera. And, and I, I addressed, um, I, I think one of the things Mr. Pivo did at the last meeting was he, he was going well beyond what one would consider at a conceptual basis. But not only that, he was trying to impose his own idea or definition of conceptual uh, on that. I've listed uh, in the letter um, the definition of conceptual. It's to clarify concepts, organize ideas, and identify relationships with which to frame a study. And in this application, my client has provided more than what is legally required under conceptual site plan approval to give this commission the ability to frame whatever concerns or questions that it has. And as Judge Berger has said in one of the landmark cases, the whole idea of the conceptual application is a common sense planning tool for the applicant and for the commission to understand what the applicant wants, to understand what the commission wants, and try and work towards a mutual goal if that is possible. But it's still means that we have to meet all the other requirements under any regulatory scheme that applies to the property. And I've cited a, a couple of cases in here um, that address the response from the CFE. Again, I'm not going to go into those because while I think they may be helpful in your decision making, um, I've gone over those cases enough, and ultimately, regardless of, of what my position is on those cases, regardless of what Attorney Reynolds' position is on those cases, regardless of what Mr. Carey's permission, although obviously he's your counsel, ultimately, if there's a disagreement on how to interpret those cases, only a judge is going to be able to tell us what it actually means. And with that, let me just check my list here. I think um, I'll reserve time just in case to respond to anything from the public, but that would be it. Okay, thank you. Um, Attorney Reynolds, would you like to come up now? Sure, thank you. So I'm Roger Reynolds. I'm counsel for Save the Sound. Um, our previous name was Connecticut Fund for the Environment, um, but we have formally changed it to Save the Sound now. Um, does the com do the commission members have or want a copy of the letter that I submitted to uh, Mr. Mul Mulholland? They have a copy. They, they have a copy of the one it's to follow up tonight. Copy. Okay. Is, Jeff, is that correct? They yeah, all have a have copy. A, we have Thank you. Does anybody else want a copy? You have a copy? Yeah. Okay. So I think we're good. So 
maybe I'll read uh, the letter into the record. It's fairly short, and then maybe I'll respond to a couple things uh, that Attorney Garrity has said. So uh, Save the Sound is a nonprofit 501c3 membership organization. We advocate for protection and improvement of the air, land, and water in the entire Long Island Sound region, including the Sound itself, its rivers, its tributaries, and both the human and wildlife communities of its watershed. And before I start, I'm here on a technical legal matter, but uh, I did think, I did read and uh, thought the comments of both Don Danilla and Save the River, Save the Hills were well thought out and would urge you to uh, consider those carefully. Dear Commission members, I am writing on behalf of Save the Sound to reply to comments made by Attorney Garrity during the March 21st, 2024 hearing on this matter in response to my March 21st letter regarding the zone at permit application for 91 Boston Post Road. First, I reiterate that there is no basis in the plain language of East Lyme zoning regulations or in the Affordable Housing Appeals Statute for the idea that a conceptual site plan has any relevance outside of the context of a zone change application. Indeed, even with, within the context of a preliminary site plan, uh, preliminary site plan submitted for an East Lyme zone change application, Judge Berger recently stated, the commission's conditional approval of the preliminary site plan is of no moment. It neither approved nor denied the application or even mandated anything. Presuming the plaintiffs supply all of the necessary information, the application for the final site plan will be evaluated under 8-30GG to determine whether the project can be safely constructed in compliance with general statutes 22A19 and our environmental laws. Uh, he then remanded uh, the matter to the Zoning Commission for more proceedings. Attorney Garrity did not seem to contest in the menace that this case is on point. Instead, he cited two cases that he claimed require a decision on a conceptual site plan, even if it's not part of a zoning application, uh, despite the fact that uh, there's no basis for this in regulation or in state statute. The primary case, JAG Capital Drive versus East Line Zoning Commission, 168 Connecticut Appeals 655 in 2016, does not support his point and in fact supports our argument that a conceptual site plan is not relevant or actionable outside of the context of a zone change request. Um, that case involved a final site plan, not a conceptual site plan, um, approval request. It stands for the very basic and uncontested proposition that one can seek final site plan under 8-30G without first securing a zone change. As such, applications are not controlled by zoning regulations, but they're controlled by uh, the 8-35 part test. To do so, however, one must follow the procedure followed in JAG Capital and fi file a final rather than a conceptual site plan. The final site plan in that case was complete and had already been fully through wetlands and the entire process before the court considered it. The conceptual plan at issue does not meet that standard and has no basis in the East Lime Zoning Regulations or 8-30G outside of the context of something that may be submitted as part of a zone change request. There is nothing in JAG Capital that even discusses, much less requires, consideration of a conceptual site plan in the context of an 8-30G site plan approval process. The, so we are not arguing, as Attorney Garrity has suggested, that you have to, he has to have his own change. We acknowledge under JAG Capital and many other cases that you can um, put a site plan directly through 8-30G, but it has to be a final site plan. There's no such thing as a conceptual site plan uh, directly under 8-30G. Um, the other case that Attorney Garrity relies on, Carver's Bridgewater Zoning Commission, which is a 2019 Superior Court case, um, it was a Superior Court case that disregarded statutory language, prematurely and inappropriately reached out to decide the conceptual plan issue when it had no jurisdiction, misinterpreted case law, and relied primarily upon Judge Berger's initial 2018 landmark decision which was not on point because it involves zoning and which was superseded by the final 2021 landmark decision, which I read earlier. At issue in Carr was a complex, long-running set of applications, and the issue was whether this was part of the previous application or a new application. The court ultimately found that the court had no jurisdiction over the application under 8-30G as it did not constitute an affordable housing application. Um, that was separate from the whole conceptual site plan. 
Despite the fact that there was no affordable housing application and therefore no jurisdiction, the court inappropriately reached out and opined in dicta that it could review a conceptual site plan even though there was no zone change requested or final site plan approval requested. To make this decision, however, the court relied solely on cases that involved a zone change request. And these were Kaufman versus Zoning Commission, West Hartford uh, Interfaith Coalition uh, versus Town Council, um, the earlier Judge Berger decision um, in 2018, um, which again, all of them were applications for zone changes. That's why they were considering a conceptual site plan. The dis distinction between seeking a zone change and seeking a final site plan approval to build are substantial. A zone change modifies a map. Nothing's going to happen after a zone change, whereas a site plan approval allows construction of a specific project. In the instant case, as in JAG Capital, the applicant has chosen to prove, pursue a site plan approval and therefore, as in that case, must provide a final site plan with all the relevant information, including all environmental information and a wetlands determination, before formal approval or rejection can be rendered under 8-30G. There is no basis for it to provide whatever information uh, whatever information it wants, whenever it wants, and demand a formal decision on whatever part of the application it has chosen to provide. Thus, the plain language of the East Lime zoning regulations in 8-30 GC only discuss consideration of a conceptual site plan in the context of a zone change applications, and for very good reason, do not address final applications uh, for approval under 8-30 G, which is before this commission. While an applicant may file a conceptual site plan, or a request for feedback or however else the applicant chooses to style it and the commission at its discretion may comment on it such feedback does not have to be in the form of a formal formal approval or disapproval and is not a final decision and will have no binding effect on future decisions involving an actual site plan so just to be clear a conceptual site plan is uh, a document that's submitted so uh, the Zoning Commission can consider whether a zone change should occur or not. It is not a proceeding in and of itself, um, so there's no formal decision involved in it. You can give feedback. Um, it sounds like uh, Mr. Mulholland has provided feedback, and that's perfectly fine and appropriate. The only thing I'm contesting is whether this Zoning Commission has to make a yes or no decision because basically that decision would be meaningless. The only thing the Zoning Board can say is assuming it applies with all the uh, final site plan requirements and you come back and you demonstrate that and it goes through wetlands and everything else, then it's approved. Um, but that's the case anyway. Um, let me see if there's anything else that Attorney Garrity said tonight that I'd like to reply to. Excuse me. Yeah, absolutely. Can you repeat what you just said. Clarify your last sentence. You said, and then it's approved. What is that? Assuming that all the information is provided um, and they meet all the requirements for a site plan, if and when they provide that information, it will be approved. Automatically. If if it meets all the regulation, if it meets the regulations the Commission has to approve. That may be a pithy way of saying that there's nothing um, to decide right now. Basically all you would be reiterating is the basic concept that if they submit all of their applicate all of their materials and it meets all the wetland and zoning and uh, other requirements then of course it would be approved. The Zoning Commission would have no other choice. Yeah. You, you seem to be suggesting that we take no action on this, but if we take no action, it gets approved by just by the expiration of, of, of the time limit on the public hearing. What, what have we gained? I, I, Judge Berger, when he tried to make a decision on the site plan, realized there was nothing to make a decision on. So whatever you do, if you approve it, it's basically going to be meaningless because it's not going to bind your future actions. Right. I've been saying if you disapprove it, it's going to be meaningless. Um, so as long as that's acknowledged, um, then this is really a, a, 
a somewhat technical point, but my point is I think attorneys are starting to uh, submit conceptual site plans, uh, require sort of demand and approval, and then claim that approval means something um, in further proceedings, but there's absolutely no basis for that. If they're only seeking feedback and, uh, you know, confirmation that they can go through to the final site plan process, uh, then there's no issue with that. But it just, it doesn't mean anything to approve or disapprove because there's no such thing as a conceptual site plan proceeding outside of a, a zoning change context. Are you, are you, I was going to ask the attorney Kerry if he had any response. If you're finished. Yes, I am. Should I Thank sit down? <laughs> no questions <laughs> for me? <laughs> I suspect you're going to be up and down a lot tonight. <laughs> okay, well, that was not I'll stay up for a bit. Well, all I really was going to say in response to Mr. Reynolds' um, comments tonight is that I think Mr. Mulholland and I have stressed throughout this proceeding a uh, concern that, uh, well, I have, I have mentioned my concern that there is no such thing as a conceptual site plan as a standalone entity. Um, but the applicant has threatened, I think that's not too harsh a word, that if you don't act within the, the time provided, it was 65 days extended to today, that they are going to seek a deemed approval in court. Now, a deemed approval of what? I, I agree with uh, Attorney Reynolds. We can both read the landmark decision that Judge Berger wrote in 2018, where he does indicate, oh, it's 2021, I think, actually, is the one I'm look, looking at, um, you know, where he says essentially what Attorney uh, Reynolds just said about conceptual site plans. Um, and he indicated that, you know, whether they're approved or disapproved um, doesn't really matter a whole lot. Um, he cites a case from a different, uh, a zoning case, but from a different context, um, dealing with sort of preliminary statements, decisions by a commission on a zoning application, not an 8-30G application. And in that case, the Supreme Court of Connecticut found that uh, those actions by the commission uh, weren't binding on it going forward. But my concern is a few. Attorney Reynolds' arguments are, I think, sound um, from an academic standpoint and maybe from the standpoint of an argument at the Supreme Court a year and a half from now. But you are confronted with an application that you have to do something with. And I think if you just kick it back and say, you know, there's no such thing as a conceptual site plan and don't do anything else, that you're going to be confronted with this argument that you didn't act you didn't do anything within the 65 days, and they're entitled to whatever it is they're going to claim they're entitled to. Um, and I think what Attorney, Attorney Reynolds just indicated, that lawyers, I assume in other places, are filing these conceptual site plans for 8-30G and then going to court and arguing that the conceptual site plan entitles them to a building permit. I think that's what I heard him say. Uh, Judge Berger made it clear that, that, in his opinion, in a superior court case, which is not appellate level, an appellate-level decision and isn't binding on anyone, uh, any of the other judges, um, I think he made it clear that um, until a final site plan is filed, that uh, nothing is binding on the commission. I don't think, I do not agree with the assertion that you are subject to a deemed approval if you do not act on this conceptual site plan within the time provided. But I don't think you want to run the risk of that. <laughs> I think you want to act. You can, and one of the, if you, whatever your decision is, for or against, I think you can say something in the decision to the effect that we don't know what a conceptual site plan is. We don't know whether we really even had to do anything on this. But we either deny for the following reasons or we approve with the following term modifications and conditions. Um, so again, I don't know that I necessarily agree, disagree with anything Attorney uh, 
Reynolds said, but I have a slightly different perspective, um, as, as do you. And so I would I would urge you to take action tonight before midnight, and uh, and include if if you feel it important or correct, include in the action uh, some statement as to we really don't know what this what they were applying for, and if you do approve it with modifications, I would urge you to put something in there to reinforce the repeated assurances you've received that there will be no application for a building permit or a zoning permit until a final site plan is brought to you um, for you to act on, plus up or down. When you act on that, you have to apply the 8-30G standards. It's not a question of whether that application meets the zoning regs, because they don't have to meet the zoning regs. That's what 8-30G is. Um, so I think that's all I have. Was there anything else? Could I ask your opinion on so just, just see if I understand this correctly. It seems like the only way we can retain any control over this project is to approve it with very strict conditions. Because if we turn it down, we're likely to lose that immediately in court. Is that about to sum it up? Well, I don't know if you're going to lose it necessarily. Um, I, you know, there, I, I am slightly concerned that if a conceptual site plan is approved or if it's denied and then a court finds that you, you acted incorrectly, uh, that the applicant is going to take that and bring it to the building official and ask for a building permit. That's been my um, fear also. Hmm? That's what I've been afraid of since from the beginning, that this conceptual site plan would take on the guise of a, of a completed project well, somewhere down the road. And we, our concerns may be totally wrong. Um, but I don't know, I personally am not willing to run the risk of saying you don't have to decide this within 65 days or 85, whatever it is now, um, and that you don't have to decide it. You can just kick it back and say, we don't even know what you applied for here. Um, here are some ideas if you really want to develop the property that we think you ought to look at and some uh, information we would need for a more definitive application. Um, yeah, I've had that concern all the way through on this, and it's not because I, uh, I am... Um, disbelieve anything anybody has said. Um, it's absolutely not that. It's just, um, you know, if, if, they get, if they get this approved or if they get it denied and went on appeal, uh, I would think there's a temptation there to claim that they've got something that they can use for construction. And I, don't, I don't know that you need to deal with that. Uh, or you can, I think you need to do the best you can to avoid that uh, coming true. And I have no idea whether you intend to approve this, deny it, or not. And I think I said this a couple meetings ago. I think when you vote on this, you need to apply the 8-30G standards. Um, because I th when you read the statute, and I read you the, the part about conceptual site plans at one point, um, it says, as Attorney Reynolds said, a, a commission can enact a regulation requiring a conceptual site plan as part of his own change application for 8-30G. Um, there is no zone change application. The applicants have very much, have very strongly disclaimed that. They're not filing a zone change application. They filed a conceptual site plan. So they're not saying they're even applying, they aren't even saying they filed an affordable housing application. But I think you ought to treat it as if it is. Um, and then, you know, we'll see what happens down the road, I suppose, one way or the other. Is that helpful at all? <clears throat> Would you? If you have a question. I, I didn't have a question for you. I had a question for Attorney Gary. I don't think that's the time. Oh, okay. Um, we do need to... Norm oh, Norm, do you have... I'm yeah, sorry. I, would you repeat the two items that you recommended that we include in a motion? Oh, um, actually, I, I think I only said one, uh, which would be that... You really don't know what a conceptual site plan is, but you're denying or you're approving the application that was presented to you for the following reasons. Um, and I would just have that as a reason for your action one way or the other, um, but I wouldn't have that be the only reason for basically just saying, you know, thank you for presenting this to us over four nights, but uh, we don't think we have to act because you didn't give us anything that's actionable. I, I, that may be how it turns out in the end, but I don't think you want to take that chance. 
Okay, we need um, maybe to move on to see if there's anyone from the public here tonight that has something that has not been said in the previous several meetings. And if there is, can you keep it to three minutes? Oh, yes, come on up. Hi, my name is Petey Reed, and I live on High Street in Niantic. Four High Streets. And all I want to say is that when you're considering the plan, I read something about a sod farm that might be possible in this plan, and that is one of the things that would completely pollute the Latimer Brook. It's, it's a very, very bad idea, and um, it would ruin our river, and that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak tonight for, against, neutral? Okay, let's move on. Are there any more questions from commission members for either three, either of the three attorneys? I had a question for Attorney Garrity. Okay. <clears throat> Way back on your first night, was it your intention to seek deemed approval? No, I didn't think it was. No, not not for 65 days. If I believe it, what I remember mm -hmm. is you said, "I'm coming forward with this conceptual site plan, seeking uh, the uh, information from the board on on what will work and Correct. wouldn't work." Fair enough. Fair enough. Didn't think it'd take 65 days. That's I for sure. Much as I like being, well, I, I'm sure you're all nice people. You know, I'd prefer to be home watching, binging on something. Yeah. So we TV that is. We, we did say that we could take no action, or, or we had to take an action, or or some something in between. Um, but I think we did make some progress. I I think that we heard about the sod farm. Right. And we've and told you that's off the table and, and then out. and then we had said that if it was on the table it would have to have its own approval right so at this time as part of this, the the project i don't i don't think that's a that's a, an issue so we did make some progress on that yeah. originally it was in all right um we did get some um progress with the eight acres that you would be willing to to give to the town correct all right so that that's a, i think two two major advantages I guess what I want. Well, I should say to the land trust, but it, oh, as open space, but <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess. I guess what I I, I wanted to ask is because we had so much stuff, and even tonight, so much stuff. Where, where do you think we're at loggerheads? Where do you think that we're not in complete agreement? Where Where is your feeling? And I know you're. I, I'm not asking, but is there anything that you have heard that you've asked that you're just like, oh, we can't do it? I'd have to think back, but I I don't think so, and I wouldn't say that we're in agreement or disagreement I think we've presented what we believe you need to make a decision on this application there have been pros and cons presented by the public and and uh, we told you what staff asked of us in this when we said we're agreeable to doing all that or we either got a general approval from staff I mean obviously we've got to fine-tune it but not sure N nonetheless um, I, I don't know that that there is um, any sort of large-scale disagreement. I know there, Mr. Pivo was having some issues with sight lines and how you interpret that and whether you figure the speed limit. That's the, hence the report from my client, Kristen Clark, on this is how the state of Connecticut requires you to do it. Mr. May is here, so if there's any specific questions on that, but I think he answered them at the last hearing. So, and I, you know, obviously the commission members don't necessarily express what they're thinking during this they 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 ask questions and so forth but they don't say well i'm for it i'm against it so i don't know that we're we're in disagreement essentially um on that um i think we've tried to present the as much information as we can to you to give you some idea that this is what we're proposing there may be some changes that we can accept from the commission if it imposes changes or conditions on it we're opening to obviously we don't know those until after you've decided so I can't tell you in advance yay or nay on that but um, we've done what I think is the best possible to give you what we have 
in the fact that you know can we be somewhat flexible we probably could be I, I but i i don't want to answer anything other than that because i don't know what you might ask or what you may think is flexible we may not do you know what i mean we talked about the roadways yeah and sight lines right and and i know that the speed limit's 35 and i know maybe people drive faster than them. I don't know if there's any more questions on that. It, I, it was. I think it's a concerning. It, yeah, we have and, it, and, and, and it, the sight line information, my client showed the, dip, the various sight lines depending upon the different speeds. And we have a sight line up to 445 feet, I believe it is, that's well beyond um, what's required under the speed limit. So if there's concerns about people speeding through there, um, we have more than adequate distance. But again, you know, w the state regulations don't, bind us to everybody well they, they 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 have to pick standards so they pick the speed limit the speed limit is decided based on the road design curvature etc the number of lanes the, the amount of traffic and you go from there so we can meet the state sight line requirements in both directions and we can exceed them in both directions and that's in in the report on there so if there were concerns about people going above the speed limit we're telling you we've done our best possible to address that issue because we, we can show sight lines that would account for people who may not um, maintain the speed limit through there. The, 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 traffic, uh, the traffic study was, is, is, is submitted by the applicant herself. Correct. She, and she, not, that doesn't strike you as being a conflict of any kind? No. She, she's an engineer. She's also a certified professional traffic engineer. Um, we introduced that information previously. Would a, would a court accept this as expert testimony? I think a court from, I, a, from a from a, a principal party in that kind of thing. I, I think they would, but it'd be like anything, a court may w would weigh. Um, is it is there any sort of bias that they can see in that? So I mean, and that's that's <laughs> we, something. We that, will too. Well, <laughs> you, you've heard Mr. May is here. He he is an independent. No, I, I think you're being a little unjust there because as a design professional. Or, or professional engineer she's bound by she has to follow the rules so if you're suggesting that she's not then you're basically saying you know something that's that's her design her profession that's a while and so with that the report also talks about stopping sight distance not only just turning sight distance but you know we don't get into passing sight distances all the different things you need for the full design of the road but that's a comprehensive study showing different speeds and different distances to give confidence that it is a safe to turn a, a, a right turn out and then it's also safe to take a left turn in when you're heading into the property so that's that's all she's saying she used standard okay. methods that's in the textbook so I, I you shouldn't look at her name as the applicant and then look at her name as a professional and say they're two different things the well, same. I'll, I'll try all right. Well, and, and, and you know, just to kill that, I, I, I've had cases that we've tried where expert witnesses have been employees of the company that they're testifying, that is one of the parties to that, and the courts accept that all the time if the person is qualified to, okay. to testify. Right. Um, and then they judge their credibility from the testimony that they, they see. Okay. Well, for, for the depth of a conceptual site plan, you would say, hey, this is what we're thinking, and we would say, hey, as people that live in this town, did you realize it gets backed up sometimes? Sometimes it's, and and that that your traffic survey would be part of the final site plan, correct? Correct, correct. We may we, we have to go to DOT for this because it, it's on a state highway too. So DOT is going to review the traffic uh, uh, study and and the site plan um, and the sight lines and so forth, and they will make either they will either accept it, make recommendations, ch ch change it. You know, or or deny it. I guess, right, Tim? Is that how? Those different avenues. They they could ask for a turn lane. They could ask for a signal. There's a lot of different things they could do to make it work. They wouldn't just say no. But you know, but with this in mind, remember, there's a stoplight. Traffic has to stop, and it backs up. In some cases, it makes it easier to turn out of here if the traffic's backed up or turn in. So I know it gets backed up, it is. But also, there's time to turn. An acceptable 30 se wait 30 seconds to two a minute is an acceptable amount of time to wait to turn out. It may seem like an eternity for somebody, but if you have to wait two minutes, it is acceptable to wait for that time to turn out. I think. Oh, 
I think for the, the limits of what we can do for a conceptual, like we, we brought it up and we, and we talked about it, we allowed the public, I, I think we've, we've met what we're here to do. I think we've heard all the evidence, and I honestly think it's time to close the hearing, uh, but Madam it's up Chair, to the commission. If I may, mm -hmm. uh, Attorney Carey has asked me for another document, so before you close the hearing, uh, we were going to get down to the office and produce that. Attorney Carey, would you like to... Just briefly address, so if we left the public hearing open for five minutes, so i put that document in. That's been requested by Attorney Kerry. Well, sir? Well, I don't know if I requested it so much as I uh, asked what they were in order to put in the record. It's a document that I think should be in the record. Okay. So in not, may I ask what document we're talking about? We could go on with another hearing. Or we could take a five minute break. If you could just give me a minute, Madam Chair. Okay. Is, is so we've come, we've come this far. So you've seen his memorandum? No, I haven't. I haven't seen the memorandum. We're going to give it to you now, unfortunately. <laughs> well, I, I'm not going to object to anything Mr. Pyro said because he's already indicated he's made findings. I mean, it's, it's not his job. I understand. So, I mean, you can either, I would just ask, keep the record open. Keep the hearing open, and if you go on to some other business, um, actually, I think we have a quite another question from Ms. Attorney Garrity. What is the water source? Drinking well, water. The water source. The town has uh, public water within a, a connection distance that we could do. Um, the other alternative would be whether we can do on-site wells uh, or on-site water for there. And. Uh, on-site wells, assuming the town lets you have. Well, it's not the ten, that that go. Well, the, we met with the public works, and they said that there there is water that's available. One of the issues is a cost factor on it. The other issue is whether or not, um, depending upon ledge lights position on that community well or, or individual wells are, are, are available and that's something they would approve. That's, that, that's what we're talking about when we say we have to come back with other approvals here. It's not a, con a conceptual site plan approval doesn't mean, uh, and I'll, maybe I'll cover the two items I want, it doesn't mean we can go put a shovel in the ground, okay? Well, uh, my concern is that you don't get public water, in which case you need to drill a well. And I would like to see the well drilled before construction because quite possibly you don't come up with enough water pressure to function for these units. But, but again, at this stage, those are premature because you're talking about before construction. We won't be able to get permits until we can demonstrate we have the water available, whether it's public water or from, from the site itself. So that, that's what I'm saying. There are conditions being imposed, maybe not being imposed, but, but those questions as to you'd like to see that, great, but you don't, get, you don't see it at this time. You see it when we come back in with a final site plan that says we have water. And, and I'll, I'll read the, the, the conceptual site plan. This address comments from, from Attorney Reynolds and, and I believe from Attorney Kerry, but um, the conceptual site plan requirements of an applicant are contrary. Uh, my position is, it's, it's contrary to what Attorney Kerry said. It's contrary to what Attorney uh, Reynolds has said. In the landmark case from October 31st, 2011, what Judge Frazzini said is um, those types of requirements during a conceptual stage are not necessary to protect the public interest in the environment, health, or safety because they have to come back with a final site plan. And that's when you can require all of that, not on the conceptual phase. And, and then finally, um, it, attorney, and we, we put it in the record ourselves, it's an opinion letter from Attorney O'Connell of Wallace, Smith & Palmer, who's the normal counsel for the town, and even he said, if you, it had to deal with the wet, whether a wetlands application was required for conceptual, and he said no, because there's no proposed construction going to be done. It can't be done at that stage, and therefore you can't require somebody to go to wetlands first. And that's what we said. We, we're... This is, all, you know, if we have to go out and dig wells and you say, well, we're not happy with it. Well, A, that's not this commission's jurisdiction. That's the health department's jurisdiction, okay? If the health department determines that there's adequate water supply, great. If there isn't, then we have to look at getting public water from the town. But in order to come in with a final site plan, we have to satisfy one of those two uh, options. 
And if we don't, then you're going to get, well, okay, guess what? Why are we going to prove something you're not a public water for? Case over with. At least maybe. But, um, I, you know, so, so that is the concern I have is that, you know, there's been an attempt, maybe not directly to, but, but people are, are not following where we are at this stage of the proceeding. This is to understand whether or not the project itself, if we can meet all the other requirements, and there are a number of them, would be something that you would look at favorably or maybe say, well, we're, we like it, but we've got conditions we want to impose on it. Okay, we'd like to know if you have thoughts or conditions as part of any approval now so that we can address those It's part of the reason for this hearing. But you can't say, well, I don't know if you, I, I, I won't make a decision to approve until I know whether you have the water or not. We're, we're not there. We won't know whether you have the water until we start spending large sums of money to do the testing and connections and feasibility, like how much it's going to cost to uh, hook into the town's public water supply. And, and that's the whole purpose, and Judge Berger had said it in, in his numerous landmark decisions, is the idea is to avoid burying an applicant with expense so that it becomes unaffordable for the applicant. That reminds me just one other thing, too. Attorney Kerry said he, he didn't think that there was anything about this that's affordable other than, we're, say, we're coming in at 830G. We submitted an affordability plan. That's one of the key elements of an affordable housing project. So. Okay, Ms. Mullins, you need to go down to get the paper. We can continue with the outdoor ask, dining here. I would here. ask that we take a five-minute break uh, you, so that Jeff can run down and, and obtain a document that uh, Mr. Carey has referred to. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I, I think it would be, be good, too, because Mr. Carey just showed me the document. I've never seen it before, but it's the issue I raised about Mr. Pivo and his conclusions and recommendations. So okay, we want to make sure I'll take a... We want to make sure we're transplanted. We'll take a five-minute break.
Are the mics okay? We're back. All right. Um, the document that, that Mr. Mulholland referred to before the break uh, is this memorandum uh, 328.24 B1.1 by Dr. Pivo. Okay. Would you mind speaking in the mic? We can't hear you that well. Thank you. You have the memo. Okay. It was my understanding that uh, this was sent to all of you. Am I, am I right or wrong about that? I have a memo. Does yeah, everyone else? No, he no, handed no. it out earlier. I no, no, no. I mean, no, no. Dr. Pivo sent this to all of you. I, I no, refused to read it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I I know but, all right. All right. That was one thing I was going to ask. Nobody looked at it or read it? No. no. All right. I, I've always been instructed not to. It's a memorandum to the Zoning Commission and other interested persons. I think you have a copy right there now. No, no. It wasn't just him. Oh. Should I? No. Yes. No. No. Well, I, I'm going to object to the memo. It's, it's. You don't want it in the record? No. All right. Then, um, then I, that, I just wanted it to be known to you. Right. I that, know that I, this well, occurred. That's all. I, I know. It's, it's dated the 28th, and it's now the 4th. So this is the first I'm seeing. But just a brief glance, Mr. Pivo seems to be bringing in information that's not in the record, uh, contesting some of the legal claims or the, the, the legal standard for affordable housing. Um, I mean, if it goes in the record and there isn't an approval, this will be a grounds, you know, one, one of the other grounds for appeal. And I don't mean in a threatening sense. I mean, I'm just saying that uh, to the extent you consider any of this, it, it's very problematic from the applicant's standpoint, because particularly when you need to close the hearing tonight. My view, my view was, though, that it should be brought to your attention before I, the hearing was closed. I, I think it's perfect, and, and I agree with Kerry, Attorney Kerry on this. It, it should be made known that this was submitted. The commission members should each identify that if they did receive it, they have not read it, and they will not um, use it. They will not allow it to influence their decision. They'll base their decision on the record. Do you want to go down and put on the record? <clears throat> I absolutely did not read the document. I, I delete all reply all emails for freedom of information reasons. I never read them. Okay. <laughs> I deleted it too. I didn't bother reading it. I did not read it. I just emailed him that he wasn't supposed to have sent it. Yeah. Okay. I, I did not read it and I just saw who it was from and deleted it. I'm not sure about the exact document. I'm not, I can't say that I read it. Okay. Or not. Well, it's six but pages I, I, that you probably would <laughs> never, never mind. Uh, we'll <laughs> leave it at the seven pages. Of, well, if, if, if you Mr. Never. Ugas would at least indicate to the extent she had it, and I don't need to know how, you know, it, whether you read it in depth or not, or saw it and glanced at it, that you will base your decision solely on the record in this matter. Yes. yes. All, right. All right. Then. Thank you. So we'll not put it in the record. Is that correct, Mr. No, Attorney Garrity doesn't wish it in the record. Thank you. Then it's been. Okay. We may reconvene. Can I say one last thing, though, in response to something Attorney Garrity said about Dr. Pivo? Um, he's not here tonight. He's not going to vote on this. That's correct. Um, so much of the discussion earlier on was uh, is moot, I think, because of that. Um, and uh, I, he's. Well, at any rate, that's enough to say, I think. Um, I, I don't know, I don't concede that Dr. Pivo did anything wrong, legally incorrect with regard to this procedure, but proceeding, but we'll leave it at that. That's all right. Okay. Is there a motion to close this hearing? Yes, move to close the public hearing uh, to 91 Boston Post Road. Is there, okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Six zero zero. We'll move on to the public hearing for outdoor dining. Um, can, can I ask a question before we start the outdoor dining? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mulholland, have you heard of any complaints about any of these applications? No, and that's uh, one thing I was going to bring up as soon as uh, it, it, we customarily have renewed these annually all simultaneously in one motion. I've had no complaints uh, about any of the outdoor dining, so it's sort of a housekeeping issue, and the reason we do special permits is in case there was problematic. Um, I have not received any complaints about out out outdoor dining. In fact, it's been an asset to the community. 
forth of record. I need to read these, but when we get into our regular meeting, we won't have to. Um, so. Do you want to share a reading, or do you want to read them all? Um, I, I can do this part. Um, so we have an application of Eugene Emini, I may need help with pronunciation, <laughs> for Black Point Pizza for renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 44 Black Point Road, Niantic. C, application of Eduardo Marton for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 11 East Patagansett Road, Niantic. D, we have an application of East Lime Cafe, LL. C, doing business at Smokey O'Grady's for renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 306 Flanders Road, Niantic. E, application of Andy Sklovoris for five churches at the bay, by the bay for renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 215 Main Street, Niantic. F, application of EH, comma, LLC, doing business as Family Pizza for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 233 Main Street, Niantic. G, application of Leo Roche for Strive, LLC, for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 247-2 Main Street, Niantic. H, application of Chris Herbert for La La Rona for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 267-33 Main Street, also known as 13 Hope Street, Niantic. I, application of Mela Oxus for Niantic Pizza for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 53 West Main Street, Niantic. J, application of Steve Carpentieri for Niantic Bay Inn, Incorporated, also known as the Lime Tavern, for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 229 West Main Street, Niantic. K, application of Candace Devenditas for Devs on Main, for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 255 Main Street, Niantic. L, application of Martin Zavala for Zavala's for a renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 135 Boston Post Road, Niantic. M, application of Anna Lathrop for Gourmet Gallery for renewal of special permit for outdoor dining at 185 Main Street, Niantic. And N, application of Second Helping LLC for 374 Main for renewal of outdoor dining at 374 Main Street, Niantic. Is there anyone from the public that wants to speak for, against, or neutral, has a neutral comment for outdoor dining? No one? So do I have a motion to close this hearing? So moved. Is there a second? I second. Ms. Yuha seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Six zero zero. So we will move on to our regular meeting. Um, we one more, uh, what, what oh, we do about? have the application of Eric S. Parker Esquire for proposed text amendment to section 20.26 of the East Lime Zoning Regulations. However, we have all agreed to continue that to May 4th. Yes, so, open and continue with no discussion at the request of the applicant, Madam Chair. So we could move on from that. Um, regular meeting, we have an approval of minutes of March, the special meeting from March 28th, 2024. I make a motion that we approve. I, I did read it and didn't see any, any changes. March 28th, I make a motion we approve the minutes as submitted. I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Six zero zero. Um, we've already approved the minutes with amendments for the site walk of March 29th. So we will continue. We'll continue with the application of Kristen Clark, PE, for conceptual site plan approval per Connecticut General Statute 830G, affordable housing of a 25-unit age-restricted single and multifamily affordable residential housing development to be located on the northerly side of Boston Post Road on a parcel identified as 91 Boston Post Road, assessor map 31.0, lot 2, 
Um, the floor's open. Is everybody sitting on this? Has everybody who's sitting on this been here for every every night of the proceeding? Yes. All right. So everybody's familiar with the record. That's how we want. Yes. Thank you. So I, I have the feeling that this is eventually all going to get decided on either points of procedure or a law, and it'll be taken out of our hands. But I did see a proposed motion to accept with a litany of conditions and it seems to me that that's the only way we're going to be able to maintain any control over this whether it eventually ever gets built or not if we voted today to turn it down for any reason or if we take no action we're going to have no control of it and despite what mr garrity said i have this terrible feeling that a judge is going to tell us someday that we've approved it by not taking action, or if I approve it today, at least if we approve it with conditions, it comes back to us, as a, you know, in, in its full form to be applied later. I mean, I don't, whether or not this thing ever deserves to get built, I, w I won't say for now. I don't know if there's enough in the record for us to viably turn it down based on 830G requirements, but at least if we approve it with conditions, we can keep our hand in the we can keep our hand in and maintain some level of control going forward. What are the conditions? Let me, can I have that opposed? Yes. You want me to the, the opposed approval? <coughs> so, I mean, if you want, I can put... May I see what document you're doing? Or is that, do we all have that copy? Or yes. It was all emailed to, I'm gonna to read, everyone. Okay. I, I'm going to read the... I won't read the whole thing unless we put decide to put it in the form of a motion. Yeah. But, but basically, we would we would vote to approve conceptual site plan, blah, 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 all sorts of legalese here. Negative and positive. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The means by which potable water, th these are all things that the uh, applicant would be required to provide coming forward later with his site application. The means by which water and sanitary sewage will be provided. The treatment and conveyance of stormwater and avoidance of pollution and the protection of the environment, environmental resources, etc. Whether there are wetlands and watercourses or other wetlands or regulated areas in proximity, if so, where and how they might be impacted. Fire safety, provision of fire and other emergency services, traffic safety at the proposed intersection, the protection of Latimer Brook and its tributaries, the protection of wildlife on and nearby. Uh, uh, that's, I, I abbreviated that a little bit. I'll read it in full if we get to that point. But that's, I mean, that in broad script are more or less our concerns. And at least we get them on record as, as ha going to have to be addressed later. I, 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 I'm sorry, can I talk? Yeah, yes. I'm done. I, I, yes. Complete, I completely agree. And, and I, I, from the cheap seats, watch this unfold. And, and I really think that the applicant was coming in here looking for some guidance. Hey, this is what I'm thinking to do. And then they started getting really hammered. And 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 that's why I was trying to sum up. It was like, I, I've never seen something go off the rails as quickly as that did. And, and you're right. I mean, and these are all things that the, like some of the members of the public had brought up for us. I don't think we need to talk about whether it was land trust or not because that's been that's been brought up and decided, you know. And and I know that some people are aren't ever going to want a project built near them, and I understand that. And, but that's <clears throat> that's not the situation here. I'm just trying to think: was there any more conditions? Because it was over it was over several nights that aren't in here. I think this is everything. But I'm just: does anybody else think of of one more that we may have talked about that didn't make it here? The conditions, I can't answer that, but I can only comment on the conditions, and the, the, these are standard right. conditions that every application. Traffic, water. Yeah, yeah. it's nothing <coughs> that is unusual to even this site. I have a problem uh, with the project, and I, I suspected what I did see 
I was I was only up there twice in my life, but being reminded of where things are going to be placed. Basically, you have a steep slope and another steep slope with a driveway. And with buildings built into the hill, septic system up the hill, leaching field on the other side of the development down the hill. That bothered me a little bit. Um, a very tough piece of ground to develop. Um, I am afraid of the Latimer Brook, a tributary to the Niantic River. Um, bad things happen on hills, especially after they're developed. Um, very much afraid of that situation. And also, to a slight lesser degree, but to a significant degree, uh, the traffic situation, the access and egress. Um, during a public hearing, I was surprised that uh, uh, Mr. Pivo's comment in regards to the actual speed traveled versus the speed limit was kind of squashed by the applicant. Um, I've seen indications where the actual speeds are considered and significant. Um, it's a tough, tough place to get in and out of. The no left-hand turn uh, condition that was presented uh, places such an con inconvenience on the people coming out of the site. I can't help but think that the temptation to go left will be strong because of the inconvenience will be quite high. Uh, go around the world and come back the other side, but um, those are my concerns. I have a real problem with the application. I feel these uh, issues do outweigh the need for affordable housing in East Line, and I think there is a chance that uh, they could stand up in an appeal. Would, since we have a, a traffic, one, one traffic ex expert that was for the applicant, would the town ever hire a, a, a traffic a, a person to, to, to provide another opinion? Would we ever do that? Have, it's been I, done. I know, I know people that have opposed projects have hired, but I don't know, if the, should the town do it? Because it's late, too late. Okay. Well, not for the final site plan, but for the conceptual it is, but for the final would right. be too okay. would it? Yeah. Would it be? If we get a chance at deciding on the final <clears throat> plan, yeah. Maybe we could. Would there not be state DOT? I mean, yes, state I think you're right. Well, when you, when you pulled out, when, when you did the site plan, were you there on a Friday, correct? So it was normal, normal traffic. Was it hard to pull out, or what was your finding when you left it? I walked. Oh, you walked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can speak to that. It, it was extremely hard to get out of there. I looked right. I looked left. Nobody was coming. I looked right, and then I went to look back again, and people were 50 miles an hour around the corner, coming so fast. I almost got nailed. Sure. And I've driven by there several times during this hearing. And I tried to slow down as if I was going to turn and I put my blinkers on. But I think people thought I was blinking to turn down at the four corners. And oh. no one slowed down behind me at all. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I truly am worried about accidents happening there. It's a uniquely bad spot. I mean, if you're turning left to turn into this proposed project, there isn't room next to you for a car to get around because of the, it pinches there for the bridge. And the traffic will get backed up right. in the summer, to, and it's not even summer. Right. <laughs> I mean, the people who yeah. live here know this. If we're going to turn this down, I think the traffic is our strongest. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Mulholland, you've seen a, a, a lot more of this than I ever will. Well, in your opinion, do you, when you do a traffic survey, do you vote on the posted speed limit or the actual speed limit? What, what's actually done? Again, in a final, DOT at some point has got to give them a permit. In a sense, I believe that's somewhat irrelevant, in my opinion, at this irrelevant stage because it's a conceptual site plan. Uh -huh. You have to determine, and, and some of you are on the sidewalk and others have personal knowledge of that area, and you have to determine based on that knowledge and the, and the, the record what your view is as part of your overall determination, whether it's for or against. There's questions on the traffic. You've expressed that, mm -hmm. so, and you've articulated that to a point. So should you go to a motion, then that needs to be considered. And I think there you've had some suggested uh, language uh, to work off of, so that hopefully is helpful. I also have another question for Mr. Mahalan. In in your past experience with affordable housing applications, if it is denied, is there any chance to put conditions on later? Any conditions? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, if it's denied and let's say it's litigated, it could be remanded back. That has occurred previously on other affordable housing applications. This commission has seen at least a dozen, if not more, affordable housing applications over the, the last many years. Um, it could be upheld. It could be overruled. Um, our experience has been some of them have been uh, remanded back, others have been upheld, and some we have lost. So there's been a combination, and often it depends on the record. It depends on the judge and the arguments. Um, Good. So if you deny it or approve it, we may see it in, in another form. If it's a denial, any applicant can come back in a, in a week and make a reapplication. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of that, but I've got one case where I think it might be even be 15 years old. It's still being litigated. Mm -hmm. I have, I have one I'd like to... Yeah, go ahead, sir. They had, <clears throat> they had offered up the uh, um, the eight acres of land. Uh, I, I, can we put that access, public access to the, uh, as a condition? Or would that be overstepping on a... On a uh, um, in my kind of, opinion, I think... It's not a safety thing, it's just a... It's kind of meaningless at this point. Yeah. Okay, okay. Honestly, I mean... But I keep coming back to the same point from the first night. I mean, what, what exactly are we accomplishing here? They have to come back with a full plan anyway. If we turn them down, they don't even have to bother going to court if they don't want to. They can just come back with their with their primary application anytime they want. I mean, I, I just, I mean, I, don't, I mean, I don't need to sound glib about this, but it almost doesn't matter what we do. So you're you're leaning towards a, approval with with the um, I can I can see it. I, yeah, I think yeah, so. I, I think so. I hate to, I, I hate to, th you know, I, I don't mean to sound like I know what's going to happen, but I hate to throw money into the town attorney's budget for something that's, you know, just kind of meaningless. Even if they go to court and the court upheld us, they're still going to come back with a site plan and a formal application. We're going to be right back where we started. Nothing's going to change. But I think, I think we did accomplish something as a board by getting these conditions in. Well, we haven't gotten them in yet. I mean, but, we have, it, yeah. do we have, in order to put conditions on it, we have to approve. I'm leaning that way as well. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean it's, it's counterintuitive, and it sounds like kind of silly, but that's the only way we can control, we can control it. And, and it still isn't going to be binding when they come back. This is only conditions on their conceptual plan. I mean, we're, we're saying going forward, if you come back with a real application, these are the things that you're, you're going to have to explain to us. And like, like Norm says, they're pretty standard things anyway, but at least we got them on the record, if you will. Yeah, I, I agree. I know I've been on the fence on this since they started. I think we do need affordable housing. The, I mean, the architectural sketches were, you know, nice looking. <laughs> They're, you know, they're close to shopping. 
But then when you dive deeper and look at Latimer Brook, and to me the traffic is a huge thing, yeah. I think those are two huge negatives. Um, well, Latimer Brook stuff, they, they still have to get through wetlands. I do take your point. I hate to, I hate to just kick it through or kick it forward and say, well, well, wetlands will take care of it. They'll stop them or we'll get them when they do their application. It irks me to, to approve a project that I don't believe in. But I honestly think it's the best way to go. <laughs> One brief comment. Remember, any decisions based on the record. Right. That's just it. We don't have, in the record, we have some conversation about traffic, but we don't really have a counter study to show that it's, it's uh, dangerous. I mean, and I would have loved if they would have already talked to the DOT about stoplights and sidewalks well, and things like that. I know they point. don't. But that would be to me would make it a better project. Yeah. I, I have an opportunity to learn, um, Mr. Mulholland, if, if people did the, if people did the site walk, even though we didn't talk about what was happening at the site walk, would we be able to, like, to hear an opinion of what it was like pulling out from the site walk, or is that not on the record? Attorney Kerry? I, well, I, think, I think some of you have already said you know, what your experiences have been. I don't know if that was derived from the sidewalk. I think I think it was. So I think you can talk about what, what happened at the sidewalk. I mean, you obviously made it very clear at the beginning of this meeting that you had been on a sidewalk and then you put the minutes in to the record. So, yeah, I think you can. But yeah, it's just an opportunity for me to learn. Can I? Yeah, what's uh, your opinion? Two things I also really on the fence about this, but I read this little Niantic River Watershed Report, which pretty much echoes Mr. Dr. Danella's comments. So I stand by the maps which say this property shouldn't be developed. Not that this has any legal standing whatsoever, but I really, what I, in, I think when you put these applications in, you have to have access, walking access, to shopping, medications, get your nails done, get your groceries, all that kind of stuff. Why? Which is around the corner, so they need a sidewalk. Yeah. And if it's on state land, then they need to figure out how to do it. You're assuming that people over 55 don't have cars? Well, I'm <laughs> over 55 and I walk and ride my bike. I think we all are. <laughs> so. well, don't you walk and ride your bike? <laughs> Since I was 16. Well, it's time to start. Yeah. I, I just, I don't see we, that we have much of a choice either, but I see a whole lot more harm, harm coming from this project than good. I think if nothing else, this has given us the opportunity to create a plan how we react to this when it comes back as a full blown application. This uh, this reminds me a lot of Oswegatchie Hills landmark applications for the last 20 years, uh, except not as many people in the room. Uh, we're protecting the same water, same animals. Um, same ridge of granite. Same, same ridge of granite, granite honestly. Pretty much, yes. Same steep slopes. Bedrock, and we won every, just about every case. We haven't lost any. Sort of came out neutral and won. But uh, when we have in the record the Niantic River watershed document, uh, it's worked in the past. I always hesitate, and I don't like at all turning turning down projects. But this one, uh, I wouldn't. Want, I, I don't want to put my name on this one. It's just, uh, it's a hill. Well, I mean, we can uh, if we if we choose to deny it. I think that the two grounds we have that are in the record is pretty sound by the fact that it's a uniquely troublesome site regarding Labrador Brook in the river. And
and the fact that the uh, the traffic, the access to the state highway, right on the edge of a of, a, of an interstate interchange, is is an extremely bad spot and a dangerous one. I've uh, we were present for the record. We were presented with. Um, Two, I would call them outlines of m motions. One motion to approve, the other motion to deny. Uh, I've taken one of these and doctored it to suit what I wanted to say, and I, uh, I can present a motion, with your permission, uh, to deny. The floor is yours. First, as was suggested, uh, and part of the discussion here, we, I'm not sure what this motion means legally after listen, listening to our town attorney about the site plan approval, conceptual site plan approval whether this motion will mean anything or not, but I feel that we should go on the record of uh, formally voting on this. Uh, I therefore make a motion to, not, to deny the approval as follows. <clears throat> Whereas Kristen Clark, PE of Bow, New Hampshire, applicant, filed an application for conceptual site plan approval <coughs> for an age-restricted rental housing community per the Connecticut General Statutes 830G for an 11.34 acre parcel located at 91 Boston Post Road, map 31, lot 2. The project to consist of 25 total units of age-restricted and affordable housing in two apartment buildings, six duplexes, and one individual structure. And whereas the commission received referral reports from Alex Close, town engineer, Gary Goschel, Inland Wetlands agent, planning director, and Ben North, chief operating officer, and Eric Quinn, deputy fire marshal, and whereas the commission has held a public hearing on the application running over three evenings, during which it received verbal and doc documentary information from the applicant's representatives and from the Town of East Lyme staff, as well as from members of the public. In making its decision, the Commission is considering and taking into account the testimony and exhibits submitted at the hearings, and whereas for the purpose of the application, the Commission will address this motion as follows. The request for approval of a conceptual site plan application for 91 Boston Post Road submitted under Connecticut 830G statute, whereas the Commission finds and recognizes there is a need for affordable housing in the town of East Lyme, and that less than 10% of its available housing stock meets the statutory definition of affordable housing, and whereas the Commission finds that the application does not comply with the requirements of 830G because it is felt that the access and egress plan presented, oh, excuse me, the plan presents a dangerous situation. The speed limit on this section of Route 1 is seriously ignored. The temptation to egress using a left turn is high <coughs> as the inconvenience of egressing right and finding a way back is great. The site visit backed this up. Also, because of the limited buildable area of the parcel, the positions of the septic systems, leaching fields, and the residential units themselves are all forced into being placed on the steep slope without alternative. The risk of stormwater runoff and septic runoff without public sewer is significant. The risk is too great as the Latimer Brook Niantic River tributary is on the bottom of the hill. Two, um, 
the substantial public interests that we are trying to protect are the Nyanic River tributary and motorists accessing and leaving the property. From evidence in the record addressing these issues, we feel that the risks involved with developing this land does in fact outweigh the need for affordable housing in East Lyme and that there appears to be no alterations that would correct the issues. Whereas the Commission has determined based on sufficient evidence in the record that the application does pose a harm to the public interest in health, safety, or other matters that the Commission may consider, and this is in the public interest. It is therefore resolved the Commission should hereby deny the application for the reasons stated above. Do we have a second? I second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any more discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to denial say aye or raise your hand on this one. Aye. aye. Opposed? Opposed. Um, the motion passed to deny five to one. Um, Madam Chair, we'll publish next Thursday. Okay, thank you. Um, we need to move on to Outdoor dining. Do I have a motion to approve items D through which, where are we? P. So moved. Is there a second? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. Um, we don't need to do the application for Eric. S. Parker, because it's been continued, um, the two next applications have been withdrawn. So we were at old business. Um, let's, we have the outdoor dining and the text amendment, which I think he, um, Mr. Peck and Mr. Mulholland are still working on. I have been informed that Attorney Bleasdale has called the office for some clarification he is working on trying to to wrap up the um, affordable housing issue that we brought to him. So I think for new business, Mr. Mulholland, do you have anything? I have nothing this evening. Comments? Uh, I apologize. I will remind you on the 18th. We will be setting out an agenda. It's sort of a, a unique a meeting where you're going to have a presentation. It's uh, no obligation by the commission and the applicant. It's just an informational pre-application, but you will have a meeting. So okay. thank you. Nothing further. Okay. And from our ex officio. I'm sorry I missed all the excitement from the last meeting, but apparently tonight makes up for it. Um, the board heard a very interesting presentation on a feasibility study presentation for the, for the community center. Uh, as probably many of you are aware, the roof on that building is in disrepair and will need to be replaced. So the question is, is it time to take a good look at the building, which um, the architects in the study claimed the actual um, nuts and bolts of the building were in very good shape, that this was a very well-constructed building, very sturdy, uh, but the needs of the town have, of course, increased since the time of um, this building. I th sure it was 1988 that that was uh, built. So there are three cost estimate options. Uh, the small plan, <coughs> $7 million in change. Plan for a medium expansion, uh, ten, $10 million plus. And the large option, um, almost $16 million. 
it seemed that there were a number of wants in addition to needs. So there will certainly be a lot more information forthcoming on this. Something has to be done. <clears throat> Does it make sense to work on some of these plans and do this at the same time that the repairs to the, that the new roof needs to be put on? So <clears throat> there uh, also are some plans for outside improvement on the grounds as well. Uh, there is a survey available to the public uh, on the library's website and uh, also several of those surveys are available around town. So this would be a good start to conversation about uh, what, we, what we want to do, what we feel we can reasonably afford to do that will last over again another 30-year period and there is a very elaborate uh, brochure or actually manual that's available at the public library and here at town hall which anyone could take a look at and review but i would encourage you to take the time to complete the survey and provide some additional information and that's basically it for me tonight any questions? Okay, we're good to go. Uh, I'll just add the library does have free glasses if you want to see the eclipse. <laughs> They're handing good them out. Um, I don't think there has been a planning meeting since our last meeting. It's April 9th. Next week. And you'll be there. I'll be there. Um, I don't have any more correspondence. Um, I actually did have some comments, but since our full staff isn't here, I'll, I'll skip those for tonight. So is there a motion to adjourn? No, I had a question. I had a comment oh. or a question there. One of those things Norms always brings up, something from the public. Um, it had to do with um, um, the Rustic Cafe. So they, they have very limited hours because they can't get a cook, and they were... They, the, the bartender there was wondering if they could have food trucks there. And I don't, I didn't know where in our zoning regulations that would be allowed or not allowed. Mr. I don't know Mahal, where Mr. Liska, I can, can address that. We would just, I've discussed that with potential new operators and previous operators, and the answer is no, they cannot. No food truck. Well, it's vending. And if you're vending, you've got to be moving. Oh, and okay. if you're stationary, you're not moving. So then you'd be in violation of the vending ordinances. That's oh, why, okay. and so there's a restaurant there, so the idea is that they should have food service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think they're having trouble getting a cook is what I heard. Oh, it might be, I, that's probably not a new one. hire one off one of the trucks. <laughs> Can I make a motion that we adjourn? <laughs> Second. All those, in, all those in favor say aye. 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 I think the ayes have it. Thank you.